Scoured by the Earth's strongest, most unpredictable winds, the vast emptiness of the North is dangerously unforgiving. Yet explorers have been lured here for centuries. Some came searching for the elusive passage to the west, others simply to challenge themselves in one of the world's harshest environments. Perhaps the greatest of them all was Henry Hudson, who sailed into Hudson Bay in 1611. Although his namesake lives on, Hudson himself vanished in the ice and was never seen again. Seduced by history and adventure, explorers are still drawn north to experience its power from new perspectives. One of those is a man who seeks to soar above the solitude and find freedom in the frozen sky. In Ottawa, the capital of Canada, John Davidson has spent two years planning one of the riskiest northern adventures ever attempted. Winds are blowing 40 to 60 clicks. Where? Santa Kilowack. But listen to this, Monday, clear skies. High and minus six, that's not bad. His goal is to fly a hot air balloon over Hudson Bay for the first time and do it in the dead of winter. Yeah, I was about that. I've had lots of opportunity to go to various areas in the world and balloon. We still got food spots? Of all the places that I've gone ballooning, and I've done some balloon flights in some pretty great places in the world, this was by far the most attractive to me. <laughs> Davidson is a rare breed of pilot who thrives in even rarer air. He set several high altitude records and soared higher than Everest. Now, along with his ground crew of John Copeland and Matt Ferry, and second pilot J.P. Lemaire, he's ready to challenge one of the world's most treacherous inland seas. From Ottawa, it will take the team 30 hours of hard driving, 700 miles due north, simply to get to their jump-off point on the coast of James Bay. At a Cree hunting camp, the team makes final preparations for the real journey to begin. For the next two months, they'll travel across the ice of Hudson Bay, searching for ideal conditions to launch their balloons. They will tow a heavy load, including a vast array of high technology. This is a world where trouble is easy to find and even harder to escape. So do you want me to show you on the map where I wanna, where I wanna take my plane and then I'll show you where I'm gonna fly? Yeah, you didn't have to show me, I'll find you. Okay, Georgie so Snowboy knows his down. world well, the, the where wisdom is, is more precious than technology. Yeah. I'll go out, fly out yeah. over the flow edge, and then I'll come back and land where you wanted me to land. Find a place there, around Cape Jones. There's not a the nice place there. Yeah, I'll catch but up. But watch the rocks, eh? One, two, three. Five, eight, ten. Ten. Ten, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh yeah, baby, I'll take the yellow Argo. Ice on the bay is four feet thick, but traveling on it is still hazardous and necessary. On land, the snow is too deep and the coastline too rocky. Their Argo snow machines can haul a thousand pounds and will even float if the ice cracks under them. Eighty miles north of Seal River, James and Hudson Bays meet at Cape Jones, the site of an abandoned radar station. Frozen in time, it is an omen for another Cold War that is just beginning. So this is Hudson Bay on our right and James Bay on our left. 
No, this is the Hudson's Bay and this is the James Bay yeah, over here. James Bay over here, yeah. <laughs> and how far out do you think the flow edge is? Out maybe uh, three miles? A little more than that. A little more than that? No, we'll see about four. John Davidson loves to fly. To scout ahead for the thin margin between stable ice and fatal open water, he uses a unique aircraft called a power parachute. I don't know why I'm comfortable in the air. I'm scared of heights, but I enjoy being up in the air. If I get frustrated, I make a business mistake or whatever, none of them are a care in my mind if I'm up in the air. But as soon as I'm back to the ground again, all the problems come back. Yeah, this is the same kind of clutches on a skidoo, right? Davidson faces a serious problem. George might know. In the jarring cold, a clutch has failed, and the closest parts are a thousand miles away. No, we all go into Great Fall, uh, Great Fall River and leave the machine here. And come if back tonight. Have, come back tonight and pick it up and bring everything down. That's the fastest way. What's the use of waiting here? The Cree elder is right. The team has no choice but to head southeast to the town of Kujarapik. It's a 70-mile detour and a critical delay, but the town does have an airport, allowing parts to be shipped in. Located at the mouth of the Great Whale River, Kujarapik stands at the junction point between the ancient lands of the Cree and Inuit. Old or young, people here know the North as a trickster, an unpredictable spirit with many faces and many moods a character Davidson's team has only begun to understand. Is, loading? is this unloaded or loading? Doesn't seem like it's a very good tracking system. We don't know where it is. You mean is it worth looking in the plane again for a little box? There is no box in this plane stopping in great weather. Not in the track, not in POV, not in great weather. So that's the only destination since this plane was loaded. With his spare parts lost, Davidson is stuck in a world where life is dictated not by men, but by wind, ice, and the tides of Hudson Bay. Finally, John Davidson's spare parts have arrived. Thank you. All right. <laughs> get it. You have to sign the waiver. I'll sign anything you want. The repair turns out to be surprisingly easy, but after days of waiting and watching good weather come and go, the team is anxious to move on before the North plays another trick. Their route will shadow the east coast of Hudson Bay, 100 miles north to the Richmond Gulf. breakdown was a setback and that's all it was. Absolutely knew that the trip was going to go forward. We were still fresh in the trip, so I knew that we were just going to take this as a challenge and move on. The Richmond Gulf is one of the most dynamic ecosystems in all of Hudson Bay. Savage winds and swirling tides keep the water open all winter, ideal for wildlife and for John Davidson to fly a balloon. Okay, let's look at our priorities. The priorities are, I want to fly over the Gulf. That's one of yeah. the reasons we came here with the fire parachute. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do if the weather 
allows it, right? Okay. That's the first thing. So right now we're working between here and the Richmond Gulf. And do you feel comfortable going in that back slide? Mm -hmm. yep. you, know, do you, know what I, you don't want to make a mistake. You go in the golf slide and <laughs> you're going to go for a swim, right? After establishing their base camp, the team leaves immediately to scout the terrain. In his power parachute, Davidson looks down on a diverse landscape of canyons and barrens, open water, and dangerous ice. On the ground, his team intends to get an even closer look. See how fast we're tied, is it, boys? Yep. I don't know. Yeah, it's really fast. And then if you look up there, you can see where the Richmond Gulf and uh, the Hudson Bay meet, and that's where you see the two lines. So if you imagine how low it would go, the current would be dragging along and then brushing up with, an, with another body of water. Yeah, at that point, there's got to be some serious undertoes. Seriously. Created by a watershed the size of New York State, billions of gallons of fresh water have carved an escape to the Gulf through deep granite chasms. Beneath its churning surface, hardy plant life anchors the food chain for an abundance of wildlife. But not for people. Both the Cree and Inuit fear this place, leaving this rugged, uninhabited land to nature and the spirits of the North. The team's own guides have refused to come here, forcing them to find their own way in this uncharted wilderness. And even in the sky, it's easy to get lost. I think you came out of the river valley and went left. There's no other way that you would see the open water of the Richmond Gulf, and you guys told me you saw the open water. That's correct. Well, then you had to have gone north to see the open water. I can see the river valley from here. It's completely flat. It's a natural way to go with hardly any trees. The team has another problem. Their GPS locators are back at camp, a mistake that could spell disaster. But on this day, their luck holds. All right. From the edge of a granite canyon a thousand feet deep, five miles wide and 40 miles long, the balloonists finally confront the challenge ahead. Unbelievable place. Ballooning over this would be absolutely amazing, eh? If you're coming across here and you started tailing off left, the worst thing that could happen is you land in the bay over there. Yeah, you know what kind of air would be hitting you as you came down to land in there? You want it to be pretty calm. To fly a balloon anywhere on Earth demands perfect conditions. But in the North, perfect weather is a cruel joke especially in the Richmond Gulf, where some of the planet's strongest winds have been recorded. When you guys were retrieving me, you got really close. And uh, close wasn't good enough, right? Because there was a couple hills in between. We were within, let's say, a quarter mile. And we were talking to each other. Would a flare not have just said, well, I know kind of where I got to go, whether I got to go around this way or that way, there it mm. is. Yeah, that would work too. Does that sound reasonable? Yep. All right. Tomorrow, if the North agrees, they'll fly. <laughs> Early morning is the best time to fly a hot air balloon. The team releases a small balloon called a pie ball 
to check conditions at a thousand feet. That is amazing how stable that is. Hasn't pulled hardly anywhere. Oh, it's shocking. You know, maybe. Yeah, it might be pulling to the right there now. Wind velocity and direction look ideal. Now there's no time to waste. <laughs> you have to do a balloon flight when the weather says to do it. You don't do a balloon flight based on whether you're tired or not tired or whether the equipment's ready or not ready. You do a balloon flight when the wind says it's ready to do a balloon flight. Hundreds of pounds of silk are inflated with propane burners. It's a frantic ritual they've practiced countless times. As soon as Davidson and second pilot J.P. Lemaire are airborne, they make instant history, flying the first hot air balloons over the Richmond Gulf. Finally, they're in their element. Okay, I'm gonna have some fun with the water. You're gonna follow, and uh, when you get down low in the water, I'll probably uh, go up. Hot air balloons have a distinct advantage over fixed wing aircraft. They're more forgiving when they decide to come down, but not in the Richmond Gulf. So I finally got myself in a spot where I don't want to land anymore. <laughs> I want to enjoy it, but I don't want to land it. Hundred and ninety feet. Dropping 150 feet a minute. Nice and gentle. Here we go. We're gonna do a touch and go on some Arctic ice. What do you think? Although the water is cold enough to kill in less than a minute, Davidson attempts to dip his balloon's basket in the frigid soup. A very risky maneuver. Big problem, eh? Because we're headed right at the mountains, man. Unpredictably, the wind has shifted, forcing the balloon off its flight path toward a forbidding wall of cliffs. Sensing the danger ahead, Davidson knows he now has to land as soon as possible. Anywhere off the water, I guess, is a fantastic spot. It's okay, here we go. Maybe 10 seconds. Once again, Davidson must gamble with the elements and land safely on solid ice. J.P. Lemaire and the second balloon plays it safer and heads for solid ground. After weeks of cold frustration, the warmth of success is a welcome relief, but their journey is far from over. It's a new day and a new adventure. Ahead lies 120 miles of ice between the Richmond Gulf and the team's next destination, the village of Santa Kilowak in the remote Belcher Islands. I don't know if this is actually on the best They way. may be the first white men to ever attempt the ice crossing alone, a challenge the team had not planned on. We arranged for a guide for a while, but uh, the guide had problems with his equipment, which we may have too, but uh, he ran into his problems with his equipment early and. Those problems couldn't be solved, and uh, as a result, we're without a guide. We're without anybody. You don't think we're making a sound of killer? Not today, boys. Not today. We'd love to make it in one day, but it's probably unrealistic. We're probably going to have to be camping on the ice. The worst thing that could happen is it takes us three days to cross, or we come back here and the expedition ends. Looking out from the safety of the coast, the ice of Hudson Bay is a vast and very flat desert. But without guides, the team has no way of knowing what really lies beyond the horizon line.
Soon enough, they find out. Only a few miles out, they drive headlong into an icy hell. Buckled, jagged ice the size of boulders stretches north, south, and west for miles, creating a formidable obstacle. To go through it or around it could take days, if their fuel holds out. Clutch broken half. Clutch broken? Yeah. After battling the ice for hours, the decision is an easy one when an Argo breaks down. Now there's no choice, except a hasty retreat to the coast. By the time they return, even the weather has turned on them. Another vicious reminder of the North's unforgiving power. The storm has battered the camp for three days. But when it breaks, the team has visitors. Inuit hunters returning to the Belcher Islands have brought new spare parts from Kujarapik and agreed to guide them across the ice bridge. These guys are going to travel at night. Uh, I've traveled at night before. And there's no problem. It is bloody cold. If all of a sudden, an hour after sunset, it gets cold. The Inuit have wandered the north for centuries, and today their survival still depends on an instinctive respect for the many faces of the land they call home. But even the Inuit rely on more than intuition to find their way. Veterans of the north's unpredictable moods, they're reluctant to camp on the ice overnight. The safest way is to get across as fast as possible. I was firmly against going across at night. I did not want to do that. What did come of it was that uh, I don't know, 12, 16 hours of, of uh, sitting in a machine, we started to hallucinate. And all of a sudden, instead of being in this great big open expanse of ice and ridges, you were actually starting to travel up a canyon. By midnight, they're over halfway, but still 60 miles from the nearest solid ground. Daylight brings with it a welcome sight, the rocky coast of the Belcher Islands. Turning north, they reach Santa Kilowak two hours later. Physically and mentally exhausted, the team heads directly for the only hotel in town. A series of pre-built trailers that still look a lot like heaven. Let's, uh, let's not worry about anything. Let's just go inside and uh, get some sleep.
Typical of the north, Santa Kilowak is a place of extremes. A modern village isolated on ancient volcanic rock. By necessity, the Inuit are a nomadic people, but Santa Kilowak is unique. Surrounded by churning water in summer and locked in ice for the rest of the year, they rely solely on Hudson Bay for survival. In the town's cafe, John Davidson is surprised to meet Marty Obard, a wildlife biologist here to study the North's most fearsome predator, the polar bear. And once again, I mean, it, it is a very Obard is even more surprised when Davidson offers him a chance to observe them from the sky, if he can find them. John, based on the movements of our uh, satellite collared bears, it, it looks like, if you see here, the, the bears that were collared in James Bay, uh, in, the, in late winter, they tend to move up to the south end of the Belchers. And based on that, uh, one opportunity would be off the south end of the Belchers. Yeah, the south camp. Yeah, depending on where the bears were at the moment. Their plan is to travel south, to a point in the Belcher Islands where areas of open water called polinias are located, and the bears are known to hunt. Oh, great. That'll make it a little shorter, eh? Yeah. Well, I think Marty's like, he likes a little adventure as well. He wasn't going to be difficult to get up in the balloon. Here he had an opportunity to see the land that his bears travel over. Leaving Santa Kilowak at dawn, their route weaves 60 miles through an archipelago of more than a thousand windswept islands. Their destination is a remote hunting camp, located about as far south as you can go in the Belchers, and the only permanent shelter of its kind for hundreds of square miles. The journey takes 10 hours, but as soon as he gets there, Davidson is anxious to fly. Tonight, a, a very few light flurries, winds northwesterly 20 to 40 kilometers. The Inuit know this world well, but they've never seen anything like a power parachute, or the man who flies it. Davidson heads directly for the closest Bolinia, hoping to sight his first bear. In this frozen northern world, the open waters of a Bolinia defy the laws of nature. Derived from a Russian word meaning open field, Bolinias are kept open by the action of prevailing winds and swift currents. Mysterious but vital oases for marine life, they attract a host of seals, fish, waterfowl, and bears. On the surface, the land appears empty and barren. The Inuit, however, know better. To the Inuit, Polinias are an ecological supermarket where fishing nets can be cast and Arctic char hauled up even in the dead of winter. Like John Davidson, Marty Obard has traveled a long way. And he knows somewhere out there, a great predator is prowling his vast domain. Get my scoop. For only the second time since their journey began over six weeks ago, the North has again turned generous, and John Davidson's team is ready to fly. Hey, 
Thanks, guys. For Marty Obard, his first balloon flight is an even rarer experience, since this is the first time anyone has ever attempted to fly a balloon over the Belcher Islands of Hudson Bay. Soaring over jagged clefts of igneous rock, the violent volcanic origins of the islands are seen for the first time from a new perspective. Fox tracks down there, and hair tracks. He went right up the side of that. Look. Yeah, it's quite amazing. a climb, eh? What a beautiful day to be flying in Delta Island. Davidson has planned it perfectly. A gentle breeze eases them out over the bay. Conditions in the air are perfect. But on the ice, no sign of any bear activity. And no sign of tracks anywhere around those pollinias. Those are good size, though, eh? From a thousand feet, the bay ice appears infinite and ominous. But Davidson and Robard are both too busy to sense any danger. See, the, there are two little islands down here, John? Yeah. And then uh, about halfway between the second little island and the big one over there, there's a wavy line. Then it seems to split. Obard thinks he sees movement on the ice, and they move in closer. The Polinia appears empty. I certainly have a, a greater respect for the hunters here, you know. For, there have been years they've pulled in 25 bears in a week. Even at 100 feet, the abstract ice provides perfect camouflage. They could be looking for a needle in a haystack the size of Texas. Be nice, nice and gentle and quiet. Looming ahead is the last finger of land before the Belcher Islands dissolve into the bay. Under five miles. Suddenly, the wind speed picks up. If Davidson can't land the balloon soon, it will soar back over the ice and out of range for his ground crew to retrieve them safely. Here we go, boys. Good thing you secured all your stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> Holy jumping. Do you want me to take that camera? No, you should probably just get out if you can. Are you going to put that away? If you can. The wind has brought with it another surprise. Warmer air temperatures and swirling sea currents are working quickly to break up the ice around the islands. Spring has arrived sooner than expected, creating a dangerous dilemma for Davidson and his team. If they leave now to cross the thinning ice back to the coast, it could break up at any time and anywhere. But if they delay, they could be stranded here, unable to finish the expedition. By next morning, the team's sleds are loaded and ready to go. The Inuit are willing to risk the crossing if they leave now. They head due east over ice that appears safe and solid hoping it will stay that way for another 120 miles. 
But then, another mechanical breakdown. The chain is loose on the top, right? Yeah, the front chain, the very front chain. When you break, what's happening, I think, is a link of the chain is jamming against the little uh, square frame. I think that uh, we're, we're into a camp overnight, for sure. Kelty camp. No comments on that one? Well, I say it's it's noon or 12.30. Let's just go. Let's see how far we get. We'll reassess at 6. Okay. An overnight delay on suspect ice is not an option. Fortunately, the Argo repair is an easy one, and the caravan quickly moves on. About 20 miles out from the shoreline, we went across a crack. It wasn't a really big crack, but it hadn't been there on our way to the Belchers. So I think the urgency started right then. You know, it was going to be a bit of a race to get back, depending on how the weather was going to treat us. Six p.m. comes and goes. They've driven hard for over eight hours. And with the light failing, there's no thought of stopping. By sunset, the race is on. 60 miles of ice still lies ahead. And another midnight crossing. After traveling for 30 hours across open sea ice, the last 10 in the black of night, the expedition has made it back safely to the east coast of Hudson Bay. Battered by a late winter storm and plagued by exhaustion, the team has crumbled into camp. Outside their tent, it's hard to believe that spring has arrived. All they can do now is wait for the North's fury to subside. By next morning, the snow has eased off, allowing them to prepare for the last long trek home. With time and now speed of the essence, there will be no more flying. I mean, the propane weighs quite a bit in the bottles and uh, we're burning it off to reduce the weight of carrying it on the, on the land. But uh, for a balloonist, it, it really is. A, I mean, I've hauled that propane all the way from here to the Santa Kilowack and back, so that's, I don't know how many hundreds of miles, but now I'm on my way back almost home and I'm burning it off. <laughs> Day 50 of the expedition sees the wind off the bay reach a new intensity. With their food and patience running out, the team decides it must push south, even though the visibility is zero and the wind chill minus 40 degrees. It will be a 300 mile marathon from the Richmond Gulf back to Chississippi, the beginning and hopefully their journey's end.
after mile, the wind tears at the expedition until suddenly, as quickly as it began, it stops, revealing another fact of northern life. Poor little seal. Probably won't find his mother. Wait here for a bear. Either a wolf or a fox or somebody will get it, or a polar bear. What are we gonna do? We're gonna let nature run its course. I feel bad for the poor little guy. But with a little luck, this seal pup might survive. Sooner than later, the bay ice will melt giving it a chance to swim for home. It's an option that doesn't bode well for Davidson and his team. With winter now officially behind them, the further south they go, the thinner the ice gets. After two punishing months and over 2,000 miles, both man and machine begin a final desperate race. mind was set on just get there any way we can and you know the water in some places was getting over a foot deep but I can just imagine what it looked like yellow Argo in the lead with one broken tire in the front pulling a powered parachute that was on pretty much full blast pulling <laughs> pulling a broken Argo in the back day 61 of the expedition brings them within sight of the James Bay coast without a moment to spare they've made it back. I'm drenched, absolutely drenched. I look dry up here. And my feet are drenched. The team load their vehicles quickly, anxious to return to a more predictable world. On the road south, the vanishing snow is a sobering reminder of how close the expedition came to a disastrous end. The early spring has transformed the face of the North, its unforgiving nature now melting into a thousand rivers, which will power eastern North America for another summer to come. I think that the North was kind to us on this trip, and I forget the exact saying that somebody said about the North at one time, you know, that in the first couple of years, you learn a lot, and uh, the next 10 years, you realize that you have way more to learn. Certainly, that's the truth. Like many who have come before, they leave the North as they found it, an eternal magnet to the explorer's soul.